So you hear that I'm going to give the message today. So you say to yourself, what do I expect? What's the expectation? Uh, that's a good question. What do you expect? <laughs> uh, let's, let's find out. Some of you who know me will maybe expect a little more. Some of you who have heard me will maybe expect a little less. But uh, it'll be good, I'm sure. <clears throat> So first, Father, I just ask you, Lord God, that you would bless this word, Lord, that you would just open the hearts and open the understanding minds, Father, that you would touch our pastor where he is, that you would begin to bless that service, Father, and even as your presence is there, that your presence would be here, that you would allow us, Father, in the the word and in the actions and the deeds, Father, that we do this day, that we would continue to glorify you and just to bring bring honor and, and praise and worship you, Father. Let it be a lifestyle from today forward. Amen. Amen. So your expectation dictates the expression of your faith. The level that you express your faith depends on the level of what you expect to happen. If you expect a little bit, then your faith will rise to that occasion. If you expect a lot, your faith will pump up to that occasion. Years ago, a young preacher came to Charles Spurgeon He was a Baptist pastor from Metropolitan Tabernacle in England in the mid-1800s. The young preacher had just come back from a weekend of preaching, and he was complaining just a little bit. Everybody say a little bit. So he was complaining just a little bit, and he was saying that, you know, no one got saved. So Mr. Spurgeon asked him the question. He said, when you were preaching, did you expect when you preach, do you expect? that someone will always be saved? So the young preacher said, no, I, I, I don't expect that. He said, you get what you expect. That's why no one was saved. So we're going to be reading from Mark 521 to 42 today. There's two stories that happen simultaneously, and we will see where we go from here. Amen. So now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat, by the other side, a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea. This was coming after Jesus had just been in the Gadarenes. He had just cast out the demons known as Legion and they were finished. He was finished ministering there. He came back to the other side. He comes in, he steps out of the boat. Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came. His name was Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell to his feet and he begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed. She will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Okay, so now here we have Jairus. Jairus is a leader of a synagogue. He has a reputation. He has a good standing in the community. He comes, he sees Jesus. He knows he's in need. So what does he do? Does he come up? Does he say, Jesus, I need to talk to you. Can we, can we get together? No. What did he do? He came and he ran up and he dropped to his feet. And he poured himself down and he begged him. And he said, please come with me. My daughter is about to die. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, starting in verse 25, and suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Jesus heard Jairus. He said, come on, I'll go with you. He got up, he began to move, and as he began to move, his reputation had already started to grow. He had already had the people and the crowds began to come around him. They started to circle him, they started to push in. Everybody wanted to be where he was because what he said, what he did, the things he spoke, the people he touched, miracles happened. Amen? This woman who had an issue of blood, At that time, that meant that she was considered unclean. She was unpure. She was not allowed to be there. She wasn't allowed to reach out and touch, let alone to touch the teacher or the rabbi or the master. She was supposed to be segregated. She was separated back until there was a point where she would be considered clean. But she had a need. She knew. She said, if only I reach out and touch his clothes. If all I can do is just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. So she did that. Jesus immediately, say immediately. 
Immediately, Jesus knew something from himself had gone out. His virtue, his power, he knew he had been touched. He turned around and he said, who touched my clothes? His disciples are looking at him and they say, do you see the mob of people who are coming around you? How can you turn around? How can you ask who it was that touched you? You see everyone here. But Jesus focused in and he knew who the woman was. He looked right at her, the Bible says. He looked around to see her who had done this thing. The woman comes to him, it says in verse 33, when the woman fearing and trembling and knowing what happened to her came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. She comes to Jesus. She sneaks up behind him because she's not supposed to be there. She's in the crowd of people she's not supposed to be with. She reaches out and she touches him because she feels that she's not worthy. But she still reaches out and touches him. Why? Because she has the expectation that she knows that if she can just touch the hem of his garment, that she'll be healed. That she'll be made whole. That she'll be well. Amen. While Jesus was speaking, while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, Jairus' house. They said, your daughter is dead. Why do you trouble the teacher anymore? See, in the natural, men want to tell you it's too late. In the natural, they want to tell you that when a doctor tells you that you have stage four cancer, that it's, it's done. You're, you're finished. You might as well go ahead and write your report. You may as well do your will. You may as well give everything over because your time is short. Do what you have to do, right? But we serve a supernatural God, amen? So my God does not say that we're going to believe that report. My God says, okay, wait a minute. Let me see. I'm a supernatural God. I created the earth and the heavens out of nothing. I breathe life into man. I created the animals. I created everything that you see in a week. Actually, I did it in six days because I took a day off. Take a day off once in a while. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, but only believe. How many times when we hear these things, the first things that goes through our mind, we have fear that comes into our mind. If someone starts to talk to you about a sickness, you get scared. If somebody mentions cancer, your world has ended. Okay, But that's not true, see, because I'm a, I'm a believer and a server of Almighty God, and I know that Jehovah Rapha is my healer. I know that even if he will heal, heal me, he will heal you. I know that if he can speak good things and blessings into my life, how much more can he do for you? See, Jesus is not a respecter of persons. He permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Verse 38 says, then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult. What is tumult? It's chaos. It's drama. He saw, how many of you understand drama? I understand a little bit about drama. Amen. <laughs> There's a, we won't go there. He comes in and he just says, what's going on here? Why is, why all the chaos? Why are you so upset? He said, even the people were beginning to weep. They made commotion and they wept. Jesus said, this child is not dead, but she's only sleeping. They ridiculed Jesus. And when they had, he put them all outside. So now I'm going to challenge you a little bit. When you're going through stuff, you have, you have trouble in your marriage, you have problems with your kids, you have things that are not going right on your job. And as you begin to move and you begin to go and you begin to look to God, you have those people in your life who will always put you down. They will always ridicule you. They will always say that your faith is not strong enough to get you from where you are to where you want to be. There will always be those people. But what did Jesus do? See, I think that we learn a lot if we look at the Bible and we say, well, what did Jesus do? Let's, let's, let's him be the example to us. So what did Jesus do? Jesus put him outside. He didn't even let him stay in the house in the outer room. He said, uh -uh, no, you got to go. And he separated himself from them. So sometimes we need to separate ourselves from those people that would tell you that the promises of God are not for you. Sometimes we need to step them out 
and hold on to what we have close to us and dear to us. And we need to begin to speak with expectation. And we need to confess what the word says. We need to confess what it is that our God says. We need to confess that when he talks to us in our heart, what do we hear? What do we do? I have no problem putting some people outside. But while they're out there, don't forget to pray for them so that you can bring them back into the house. Okay? There's a lot of people outside sometimes. So my first point, well, actually, let me, let me back up because I skipped. Verse 41 says, then he took the child by the hand, Jesus, wretched down and said, Talitha Komai, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately, say immediately. Immediately, immediately the girl arose and walked. She was 12 years old and they were overcome with amazement. They were overcome because they had what's, what they had seen Jesus do. They were overcome because of the expectation that he had when he came. The expectation that Jairus had when he came and he begged. That was all fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your expectation dictates the expression of your faith. What does that mean? The level you express your faith depends on the level of what you expect to happen. Again, if you expect a little, you'll get that. The pastor in England did not get someone saved because he didn't expect anyone saved. If you're in a healing service and you don't get anyone healed, it's because you're not expecting to be healed and you're not expecting to get someone healed. You're not the healer, but we glorify God through the things that he does when we're here. So if we come into this building and we have need in our bodies and we glorify God by getting up and coming to the front in the altar and someone comes over and prays, whether they pray for us, lay hands on us or not, we're here to glorify God. So the things that God wants is what matters. See, that's why I was blessed so much when Bianca was singing the song. That's why I was blessed so much last week when Johannes was here and he was speaking about the, the miracle in the movement, right? You have to get up and you have to move. You can't just sit where you are. There's things that we expect from God and we need to expect it. But there's also things that we need to do that is our part. And the first thing that you have to do is you have to get up. Get up off your seat. Get up on your feet. You've heard that before, right? <coughs> you need to know who you are and what you're willing to do. If you want to receive the blessing of the expectation of God, know who you are, and what you're willing to do. Your position or station does not matter. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. He was overseeing the worship. He was overseeing the teaching. It was a place that the people could come together. They would come into the community, and they would learn, and they would fellowship, and they would grow. We just studied this in Bible study on Wednesday nights, right? He was a person of prestige, and position. The woman with the issue of blood, she had spent all that she had, everything. Over 12 years, she had been given everything she had to the physicians. She was looking for healing. Scripture says she was no better. But it, it, it takes it one step further. It, not that she was just not better. She was depending on man. She went to the physicians. What happened? She got worse. She got worse. Her expectation at the time was, I'm going to go and I'm going to give all that I have. The physician's expectation was, I'm going to take everything she'll give me. I'm going to do what I can. Ultimately, that turned out really to be nothing because she grew worse. One was a respected ruler. He had position. The other was considered unclean. She was poor. She was sick. She was broken down. She had, after 12 years, I'm sure that she had been at the end of her rope. How many of you have been there after a week? Amen. Some of us after, you know, two, three hours in a day, you know, by 12 o'clock tomorrow, I'm going to be fussing. <laughs> she had been putting up with this for 12 years. Second, state your purpose. Know that God already knows what you need but he wants you to tell him. He wants that relationship. He wants you to begin to move towards him, not away from him. He wants you to begin to open up your heart and begin to pour out and begin to share and begin to show. And what is the key to that? 
If we look at Jairus, what did Jairus do? He was a ruler. He was a, a man of position. When he came, like I said, he didn't come and take Jesus aside. He fell down before him and he began to beg in front of everyone that was there, in front of the disciples, in front of those people that saw, in front of the people that were looking as Jesus came because it said a multitude came. And as the crowd began to, to encircle him, as they start to approach, the people start to approach. Can you imagine? They see the man who is in charge of their worship and in charge of everything at the feet of this man begging him to come and, and pray for his daughter. That's expectation. Know your expectation. Jairus begged, my daughter lies at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her that she may be healed. The woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told Jesus the whole truth. How many of you, me included, I'll raise my hand if it makes you feel better. How many of you tell the whole truth? When someone comes to you and questions you about something, you tell the whole truth, this is what happened. This is what I did. This is why I did it. This is what I was thinking. She told him the whole truth. When she told him the whole truth, Jesus' response was, your faith has healed you, right? See, she was scared. She was trembling. She was fearful. You need to understand when you do something, you come with the expectation. You're asking God to do something for you. Why will he do it? What is his motivation for doing what you ask him to do for you? John 3, 16, I like this in the Amplified Version. It says, for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world. Greatly loved and dearly prized. How many of you are greatly loved? Raise your hand and say, I'm greatly loved. Amen. And I'm dearly prized because my God loves me. How much does he love me? Why would he do for me what he did? He even gave his one and only begotten son so that whoever believes and trusts in him as their savior shall not perish but have eternal life. You have to know the result. You have to know what you're looking for. You have to know what you're asking and why he will do it. And the reason that he will do it is the same reason he went to the cross and died on Calvary. The same reason that he walked the earth for three and a half years to teach you and to show you and to train you and to give you something so that you understood that drew you to the miracles of healing. If you want to see this house full, let four or five people be healed in this house. When you see that, then these seats will be full. The word will go out into the community the same way that it had gone before Jesus and the people will begin to come. The people will begin to be filled. How do I know that? I know that because Bible study, right? Wednesday nights. We're doing the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, Peter gave a message. 3,000 people were added to the church. For you, Ron. <laughs> the second time, there was a man who was laid at the gate for 40 years. He was, he was laid out. He was lame. He couldn't stand. He couldn't walk. He had been seen there at, at the entrance to the temple. Now, we talked about him being at the temple because it meant that if he didn't get anything from you going in, okay, and you went in and you were in the presence of God, when you came out, you should have had a little more compassion in you and you should have went over and helped the brother out. But what happened here was that as Peter began to walk by, Peter and John, they looked at him and they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you. And he, he lifted him up in the power of the Holy Spirit and the man was healed. It says not only was he healed, but he began to not just walk, but he began to jump and he began to shout and he began to dance and he began to move around and he made so much of a commotion, so much drama did he cause that those people that were there coming out of the temple, going into the temple, they looked at him and they saw what was going on and they wanted to know how did this happen? So, hey, Peter, you know, Peter's a, a minister of the gospel. He's been with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. Now he, he has an opportunity to preach a second sermon. His second sermon, he begins to preach and he begins to tell them that through and by and everything that Jesus Christ did for them, that he was just crucified. The church had 5,000 people added. Now we've got an 8,000 people church in one city, Jerusalem. And the, be the beginning of the spread of the gospel went from there. Amen. I thank God for the man at the gate because if he wasn't there, I may not be here today. 
Third thing you need to know, know your expectations and trust God. Jairus said, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed. He didn't just say, come and do it so that she might be healed. He said, if you do that, my expectation is she will live. He knew what he was seeking. He knew what he was asking for. The woman said, if I only touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Not I might be, not I could be, I shall be made well. She was expecting healing when she touched his garment. Jairus was expecting his daughter to rise. He got exactly what he was expecting. Both Jairus and the woman knew what they were expecting. They knew so well that they spoke of it with confidence. Jairus said, she will live. The woman said, I shall be made well. See, we have things. I'm from West Virginia, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. Some of you understand that a little bit. In West Virginia, you have your, you have your house, you have your porch, and on your porch you have your dogs. You have two dogs. You've heard, uh, you've heard uh, Joyce Myers talk about feeding the dog. Whichever dog you feed, that's the one that gets bigger. Okay? So if you've got a dog here and you call him doubt and you call him fear and you call him anxiety and you call him depression and you call him all those negative things that put a cloud over your head and you feed into him. If you feed him with depression, you get depressed. If you feed him with anxiety and fear, you get, you get sick, right? If you fill him with anxiety, you get so sick that you get to give yourself an ulcer and then the illness begins to spread through your body. So not only is it affecting you spiritually, not only is it affecting you emotionally, but now it's affecting you physically. Because we're physical people. Amen? But if we have another dog, and we call that dog faith, and we begin to feed our faith, and we begin to feed our hope, and we begin to feed, then the reward of that is joy because we see our dog getting bigger. We see our faith getting bigger. We know that we can begin to speak things, and those things will happen. If we feed our courage, we become bold. If we feed our encouragement, we become overcomers. Amen? If we feed our hope, we don't know what... <coughs> we don't wait to see something until we believe it. We don't wait for it to come to pass to say, okay, now I get it. We believe it is already done and trust in God's proper timing for our lives. We stand in victory with Jesus Christ. Amen. We have to be at a place where our hope is Jesus Christ. And we understand that our hope is Jesus. But we also have to be at a place that we understand that our expectations draw us closer into the presence of what God wants us to do. You see, we can do a couple of things. We can begin to be pulled away from or we can walk closer to. Things will happen to challenge your expectations. In Philippians 1.19, going back to Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood, it says, for I know with confidence that this will turn out for my deliverance and my spiritual well-being. If it's for your spiritual well-being, I believe that it's also for your physical well-being. It's for your emotional well-being. It's for your well-being. Amen? This is why. Through our prayers, through your prayers, and the superabundant supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Superabundant supply. It's not a little bit. It's not just enough to get you through. We walk and we serve El Shaddai. El Shaddai is the God who is more than enough to meet every need. He has a super abundant supply of the spirit. Things will happen to challenge your expectations. In verse 20, it says, it is my eager expectation and hope. We're talking about expectation. What's the difference between expectation and eager expectation? I'm excited about my expectation. I'm not just expecting the God to do good things for me. I'm excited because I know he's going to do good things for me. <clears throat> but, with, but that with courage and the utmost freedom of speech, even now as always, here's the key. Christ will be magnified and exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Whether by life or by death. I was thinking earlier in the, in the early service, I had two men in my life that basically told me that, okay? 
But I was thinking, and we had someone here, and I'm sure that we've had more, but these three people come to my mind. My brother-in-law had uh, been diagnosed with stage four cancer. And when he was about to pass, I went in, I was praying with him, we were talking. He said to me, if I am healed, then I'm blessed because I get to spend time with my wife. I get to spend time with my kids. I get to see my grandkids grow up. He said, but if I'm not healed, I'm still blessed because tomorrow I'll be in, in the presence of Jesus. Amen. I hadn't thought a whole lot about that. And then when my father was sick, he tells me the same thing. He tells me that, you know, it's been a long, it's been a long road and I've had my ups and my downs and there's times that I've served and I've walked a little closer with God. But today I'm assured and I know that if something happens to me and I'm not here tomorrow, that I will be in the presence of God. A couple weeks after my father passed, you know, everyone wants to know what happened, you know, so they, they, where is he? Do you think that he's in heaven? Do you think that he's in hell? Do you think, do you think, do you think? My mother comes to me and asks me that question. And I can only tell her that I know that he was saved. And that with that, I have the assurance that he's in the presence of Christ. I believe that. Things will happen to challenge your expectations by attacking your faith. Don't allow circumstances to draw you away from God. Something will come against you. Jairus was walking. They came to him and they said, your daughter is dead. Why are you wasting your time? He could have really took that and it could have knocked all the wind out of his cells. He could have said, what am I doing here? You know, why am I, why am I here? Let me go. Let me bury my daughter. But he didn't do that, right? <clears throat> he used that as an opportunity and it propelled him. It propelled him to focus on God and what the expectation was that God was going to do. And he had already begged. He had already asked. And Jesus had already said that he would come. So if he already said that he would come, he already knew that he had the healing, that his daughter would rise even though she was sick. But now she's dead. She'll be fine. Amen. Now, how many of us have that kind of faith? I know that my faith at times Wavers In the Bible, you know, there was a, a man praying for his son and he says, talking about his belief, he says, not my belief, but help my unbelief. Amen. So we all at times have a little bit of unbelief and that comes sometimes from the anxieties and sometimes from the things that we go through in our life. Sometimes we just get a little beat down and it gets a little bit hard to rise up again. But if you keep your focus on Jesus and you keep your focus on God and you don't allow it to move you to the side and to take you out of the will of God, but you allow it to bring you over and refocus you and draw you in on the will of God, then great things will happen because we serve a miraculous God. Amen. While he was still speaking, it said, some came from the ruler. Second thing, do not be afraid. Don't get caught up in the drama. Instead, stand your ground and believe and confess with expectation and the fullness of the expectation of Christ in your life that what he says he will do, he will do. Amen. It's very easy to see something that happened. You go to a doctor and you get a report that says that you are sick, you have diabetes, you have a heart condition, you had a heart attack, you didn't know it, you've got a minor stroke, what's going on in my body, right? You could be a woman and you can have different things, you can have breast cancer flare up, you can have different cancers pop up and anytime that we hear the cancer word, we take a step back and we think, is that something, is, is, is that final? And at times it's final on this side of glory, but on the other side of glory, it's eternal, amen? So what we know is that if God does not heal us here, he heals us there. But with the expectation and the fullness of what Christ wants to do in my life, I begin to speak those things and I have a better shot at being healed if I'm speaking and I'm coming to God and I'm praying and I'm putting myself before him and I'm humbling my heart and I'm getting down on my face and I'm asking him and I'm telling him what I want and I'm expecting to receive that. Now, tell me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> if that's the kind of a day that I'm having, 
and I'm blessing God and I'm praising him and I'm, I'm just standing on the glory and I'm telling him what I'm expecting him to do for me that I believe that he's going to do it. Even if it's my last day here on earth, is it not a better day than to sit in your room with the curtains drawn and something up over your head where you're just sitting there saying, oh my God, I'm so depressed. What's going to happen to me? What am I going to do? Who am I going to talk to? Where am I going to go? Time stops for no man. You know, I, I, I get up a lot in the mornings and I'm getting ready for work, 3.30, 4. And that thought goes through my mind. Time stops for no man. Usually because I'm running a couple minutes late. <laughs> Time stops for no man. It moves on. The things that God wants us to do, the things that he's called for us to do, those things go on also because his word does not return void. He's already spoken creation. He's already spoken healing. He's already spoken to the circumstances and the mountains in your life. <clears throat> Jesus is here in your life. The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, you know that he's here. He's offering you guidance today. If you haven't made that decision, you're at a disadvantage. We can talk about that later if you want to. Trust in what Jesus tells you, third thing. And then do it. If you have a relationship with God, you begin to recognize and hear his voice. That's why you read the Bible. That's why you pray. That's why you talk. That's why you fellowship with other believers. It's to strengthen your faith, to strengthen your knowledge of Christ. To strengthen the relationship that you have with God. If you want a good relationship in your marriage, talk to your husband or wife. If you want a good relationship with your children, talk to your kids. If you want a good relationship with your boss, begin to open up that door and that dialogue. Because if you revert and you go back to yourself, those relationships will not be strengthened because the expectation is like the young preacher. You're not expecting it to get better because you're not doing anything about it. You can hope and you can pray. But a hope and a prayer goes, goes a long way sometimes. Doesn't go a long way all the time. There's things, put feet, put motion. What was it Johanna said last week? He said the miracle is in the motion, right? The miracle is in the movement. You, you begin to move and then you receive. I'm preparing this message on expectation. And it kept coming back to my mind. He was talking about a woman in one of his crusades in Africa and she's holding onto the wheelchair so much so that both knuckles are white. Now she's, she's grabbing, she's holding onto it. She's, she's about to do something, but she can't walk. He said from the, from the waist down, she can't move, but she's holding on the edge of her chair. What does she do? He said, he goes on with his message. He turns around before he even had a chance to pray for her. She's gone. The chair is there, but she's gone because she's moving and she's, she's praising and she's ministering. Not only just her, okay, but this is how God works when you begin to operate in expectation. Not only was she the only one healed, but those who were around her got up and began to move because they were healed also. Amen. <clears throat> you see, that's how God moves. That's how God works. Jesus is a miraculous God. People will always talk you down. It says he reached down and he took the young girl's hand and he said, Talitha Kamai, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise immediately. Go ahead, say it one more time. <laughs> immediately the girl arose and walked. Jesus is a miraculous God. He's the God of all creation. In John 14, 12, he said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, anyone who believes in me as Savior will also do the things that I do. He will do even greater things than these in extent and in outreach because I am going to the Father. Amen. That doesn't mean that I'm telling you to expect to do something and sit where you are. It means that he's already came. He's already showed you what to do. He already has given us an example. Now he's saying, Speak with the expectation that you're going to do these things, but not just these things. You're going to do greater things than these because that's what he said. You have a neighbor that needs healed, then lay your hands on them and pray for them and heal them. You have depression in your life, then, then cast it off. You know, in the early service, it, I just had a picture of the, the, in the Old Testament, they used to rent their clothes. They used to tear them off and they used to throw ashes on their head and they used to repent and all these things. But what is repenting? Repenting is 
changing your mind. It's not just changing from the sin and turning from the sin. It's changing your mind and turning your mind around. So as we begin to do these things, we need to begin in expectation to change our mind. I'm not depressed. I'm blessed. Amen. I'm not afraid anymore because I have the courage of Christ rising up in me and I can do all things because all things are possible in Christ Jesus. Amen. There are people here today who are having problems in their marriages. There are people here today who are having problems in their bodies and their emotions. It may be a heart problem. It may be diabetes. It may be that you have heard the, the cancer word. Uh, but I tell you that, that that's man's word, okay? God's word is Rapha, Jehovah Rapha, amen? Man will tell you that you're sick. Man will tell you that you're down. Man will tell you that you don't have the money in your bank account to meet this month's bills let alone next month, what are you gonna do? You don't have the money today to buy milk for your kids for cereal for breakfast tomorrow morning before you send them to school. That's what man tells you. That's what your bank account tells you. See, but that's natural. I have a supernatural God that as you begin to pray and you begin to move in the expectation and you say, God, I know I don't have today, but I know that you're going to provide for me tonight. I know that I don't have it here today. I know that my body is feeling weak and run down today, but you're going to give me strength and you're going to let me stand tall and you're going to let me begin to move. You're going to let me begin to walk in the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have a responsibility. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Speak over your children. Speak over your home. Speak over your grandchildren. Do you speak blessings or do you speak curses? Amen. If you speak blessings, you're not telling them that they won't mount, amount to anything. You're not telling them that the person that they're with is holding them down and will never be anything. You're not telling them that the friends that are associating with them are, are friends that they should not associate with because they're not going to get them anywhere. They're going to just pull them down. You see, but if we stand on the expectation and we begin to speak and we begin to say that young man that you're dating right now, I may not see it in him, but in the future, God sees that not only does he have a job, but he has a good job. You have a fine house. It may not be a mansion, but you have something more than enough to meet every need because you serve El Shaddai. He will tell you that right now you may feel a little, a little self-doubt in your body because maybe you're a little overweight or you're a little too short or a little too tall or maybe your hair is just not hanging right. But that's okay because I know a God who as you begin to pray, he will begin to work in your body. And as he begins to work in your body in five years and six years from now, you're going to stand up and the people who are giving you a hard time now are going to look at you and say, oh my God, where did this beautiful person come to? Why did I not meet them before? Amen. You see, we have to begin to speak with expectation. We have to begin to sow seeds into our children's life, sow seeds into the, the lives of our grandchildren, sow seeds into the lives of our husbands and our wives. Just because they're with you now does not mean that that's the best they can be. Amen? You begin to speak, you begin to look, you begin to expect. You know, he may come in and fall asleep. I'm guilty. <laughs> he may come in from work, had a hard day, falls asleep at six o'clock, gets up at nine o'clock, goes to bed. I wish I slept that much. Um, but see, that's, that's not what it's about. What it's about is what can I do with my relationship with my wife? What can I do about my relationship with God? That relationship has got to be done in expectation because if I don't expect anything, I won't get anything. Your expectation dictates the expression of your faith. The level that you express your faith depends on the level of what you expect to happen. If you expect the heart disease to be healed, confess it. See, the Bible talks a, a, a great deal about confession. And we get a little bit off track because what are we confessing? We're confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. If he's Lord of my life, the promises that he says, those are mine to hold on to. So if I have problems in my body, I begin to speak and I begin to confess and I begin to, to move closer to God because those heartaches and those troubles are not taking me away from him. They're drawing me forward to him. Amen. State your purpose. God already knows, but he likes to hear it from you. Yeah. Know your expectation and trust that God will do his very best for you. 
Things will happen to challenge you. That's okay. What happens when you're challenged? The first time you come and you pray for something and you ask for something, if someone hands it to you, okay, thanks, yeah. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Mom. Appreciate it. On out the door, right? But if you come in and there's a little bit of a challenge there and you have to come back and you have to ask and you have to maybe clean up your room or you have to maybe do something for it. So we come to God and we actually have to begin to clean up the inside of us a little bit. We have to begin to move and we have to begin to operate and we have to begin to expect those things that he tells us are actually what's going to come through in our lives. Because if that happens, if that happens, then I'm in the will of God. How do I get in the will of God? I give a humble heart. I humble myself and I came before him because if I'm humble, I will inherit the earth, right? If I'm humble, I will see the face of God. If I speak with expectations, I will have the promises of God. Amen. Don't allow circumstances to distract you. When Peter was in the boat, he was there, he was walking, he was a natural man doing a supernatural thing. He was on the water. The waves, the wind, everything kind of hit him, distracted him just a little bit. Say a little bit. A little bit's all it takes. That's why the Bible says give no place to the devil. Because all it takes is a little bit to tear you down. But if you begin to speak with that expectation and you begin to move in that expectation. See, Peter took his eyes off. He took his eyes off, but if you keep your eyes focused on the short and the narrow, which is the path of Jesus Christ, you get a little bit closer to him. You're not worried about what's happening over here on the right. You're not worried about the left. You're keeping your eyes. You're keeping your focus. You know what's happening. If you know what's happening, you have direction. You have purpose. You have the promises of God before you. Do not be afraid. And don't get caught up in the drama. Drama is a good thing. It's entertaining at times. At times. <laughs> There's other times where drama is not so good. It gets to be a little bit weighty, for lack of a better word. Those, those things that some people may have an accident and it's a traumatic event in their life. That's drama. That's trauma and drama together. You have a bad relationship. You have a failed marriage. You have a, a first love that you just think that you're going to be with this person and you're 14 or 15 or 16 and you think that you're going to be with them all your life. And the next thing that happens is reality sets in for today and there was someone else because now they found their true love. Okay? So you don't say, well, you know, my expectation is this person is going to be with me forever. But you say, that's okay, because my expectation is God has something better than that. God has someone that's going to treat me better than he did. God has someone that's not going to hold me down, move me back. God has someone that's going to pick me up and move me forward, is going to hold me close and is going to lead me in a path where God would take me. And this person, man or woman, is going to be there by my side because that's what they're called to do, to be by your side. If you want to raise your expectations, if you expect immediate results, you have to obey God when? Immediately. If God tells you something to do today, don't think about it, don't pray about it, don't wait on it, okay? You begin to step out in faith and as you begin to step out in faith, doors begin to open and as the doors begin to open, you get closer to the purposes that God has called you for. Why? Because you stepped out in the expectation that even though I don't have it now, God says that I'm going to have it then. I may not be where I am, but I'm going where God wants me to be. I may not be in the health and the shape that I'm in right now, but that's okay because when I'm through with this walk, I'm going to be in better physical condition because I lost two pounds up here today already. <laughs> 150 to go. <laughs> if you want to raise your expectations to meet the expe expectations that God has for you, express your faith. How do you express your faith? I want everybody to rise to your feet. I want you to just begin to, well, close your eyes for a second. And I want, I want you to begin to think of the things that, are, that you're going through right now. Whether it's a, a problem in your 
physical body, whether it's a problem in your spiritual life, whether it's an issue in your emotions. You're just not as happy as you could be. You're just not where you think God wants you to be. You're not really sure what to do. You're not really sure which step to take, what direction to go in. I want you to begin to to think that as you step out of where you are and you begin to step closer to the things that God is calling you to do, that that expectation is that today is a new day and today is the beginning of everything that you're, is keeping you out of where you need to be and is beginning to move you towards God and where he wants you to be. Amen? So I'm going to ask you for a step of faith. I'm going to ask you for an expression of your expectation and I want you to prepare your hearts to do that. So if you have in your physical body, if you have a problem with heart disease, if you have a problem with... Um, with diabetes, if you have a problem with COPD, I want you to come down to the front. Just step out in faith and walk down to the front. If you are having a problem in your relationship, whether it's your husband, whether it's your wife, whether it's your boss, whether it may be your children or your children's friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, that's okay. It's a relationship issue. I want you to step out from where you are. I want you to come to the front. See, because I have an expectation that I have a supernatural God. And if I have the expectation that I have a supernatural God, that means that there's a supernatural end and a supernatural promise and a supernatural blessing that is about to come. Amen. If you're looking at your bills and you're looking at your bank account and they just don't match. They just don't seem to be what you expected at this stage in your life. Step out, I want you to come down to the front. If, and I'll finish with this, if you don't have the relationship with Jesus Christ, that you know him as your personal Lord and Savior, and you feel that it's time that you can begin to receive, and you want to expect those things that God has called you for. You see, all are called and called, few are chosen, the Bible says. So we're all called to share the gospel. Don't feel that you're where God wants you to be. Change your expectation of yourself. And God will begin to bless you and move you from where you are to where he has called you to be. Amen. So I want you to begin to raise your hands. I want you to begin to worship God. See, because we glorify God with our worship. We glorify God in the things that we do as we step closer to him, as we begin to move out, as we step out from where we are and move closer to where he is and we raise our voice with boldness, we begin to come into the will of God. We've humbled ourselves to those who are around us. We've humbled ourselves to God. We're not concerned. every opportunity to pray and to come together in relationship with you guys but not just the deacons and the elders so if there is someone here who is in ministry head of a small group co-leader of a small group are raised up into the presence and the glory of God because of the things that he has poured into the parents. So Father God, I ask you right now, Lord, 
that if there is anyone here, Father, that needs a healing, that if there is any bad report from the doctors, Lord God, I would ask you, Jesus, Jesus, that you would just saturate this place with your presence, with your blood, Lord God, that the bloodline is already drawn and we say no more. We have the expectation today that people will walk out of this house and they will be healed and they will be renewed and they will be restored. That if you're suffering from depression, don't stay back there. Come up here because God has a breakthrough for you today. God has a breakthrough. God does not want to allow you to go out of here today with the depression that you came into with this morning. If you need healing in your body, if you need revelation in your spirit, if you need emotions to be healed, if you need relationships to be healed, now is the time. Now is the time.